home with you. We also have an evaluator form um, for Sheila, and it's really important if you could all fill that out and hand it back to us before you leave here tonight. Um, we also have our principal, our interim principal here, Mr. George Lanitas. For those of you that have not yet met him, since it's his first year at Frontier. Um, so from here on out, I'm gonna give it to Sheila. Awesome, thank you, Amy. Uh, let me just share a little bit of information about myself. My name is Sheila Knezny. I'm one of the associate directors of financial aid at UMass Amherst. I've been doing financial aid for about 35 years. Um, so I, and I also have done financial aid for two children. So I have a pretty good understanding of the financial aid process. And throughout this presentation, I probably will insert some tips from my own experience that I thought was very helpful. Um, we're gonna talk about financial aid tonight and the benefits of attending this, this presentation and the resources and the process. Um, it should take about an hour to go through the entire process, financial aid seminar. Um, if you have questions, I'll take them along the way as long as it doesn't interrupt the flow of the presentation too much because I wanna make sure that it doesn't take too long to get through the presentation. And then at the end, um, I will stick around for a while, so if you have some personal questions that you would like to ask me, I'm more than happy to answer them. But keep in mind, if you do have a general question, more than likely, there are other people in the room that have that same question, so don't be um, shy about asking your questions. These slides can all be found online at mefa.org slash events. So you don't really have to take notes. The slide presentation is available online, okay? So we're hoping to walk you through the process. We used to have a slide at the beginning of this presentation. I've been doing this for a number of years. And the presentation slide was, you can do this. So I know you folks can do this. It's, um, you're gonna get lots of good information tonight, okay? So the next slide is talking to you about what MIFA is. Massachusetts Education Financing Authority is a not-for-profit state authority that was created in 1982. It helps families plan, save, and pay for college, and they are really awesome. So I highly encourage you to keep on track of your college planning with MIFA. Um, the evaluation form that you fill out tonight also allows you to put down your email address and it'll, they will send you um, timely emails. They won't be long emails. So right now, the, the emails will be probably about the financial aid process. But as we get a little deeper into it, they might talk to you about the admission process. They're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. They have really great webinars. So for example, if you have questions about how to complete the profile form, there is a webinar out there on MIFA.org um, about completing the profile form. And then the MIFAPathways.org is awesome information for high school students. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about our agenda for tonight. So the agenda for tonight is we're going to talk about the types and sources of financial aid the application process, how financial aid decisions are made, paying for college, and free resources. So before we start talking about the types and sources of financial aid, um, this is where I'd like to provide a couple of tips that was really helpful when we were doing financial aid for our two children. The first tip is to create a Gmail account or a Yahoo account, some unique email account that both you and your student has access to because more than likely, not more than likely, definitely, all of the information that you're going to be getting from schools will be electronic. They're gonna send emails. And you wanna be able to read those emails too. Let's just say that um, it's, a good, it's a good process for you and your student to have access to those emails because some of these emails that they're going to send will be for additional documentation, uh, follow-up questions, so it's all going to be electronic. And the other thing that is really helpful 
is to either set up a Google Doc or um, folders. So once you have your list of colleges that you are interested in applying for admission, create a folder. And on the outside of that folder, put the deadlines for, for admission and financial aid because each school can have a different process. And this way, you have a folder or you have a Google Doc and you can refer back to that document and I guarantee you throughout the entire senior year and even beyond that. So for example, if, if they get a merit scholarship, we're gonna talk about merit scholarships in a little bit. You may wanna refer back to that merit scholarship letter because perhaps after the first year you might forget what the stipulations are for keeping the award. So you're gonna pull out the letter and you're gonna look at the letter. So it's really helpful to do those two things. Create um, some sort of a document that keeps track of each school. And if you have more than one senior, there's a set of twins, then you want separate folders for each one of them or separate documents. On to the types and sources of financial aid. So what is financial aid? Make sure we're on the same slide because they're doing it back there and it's behind me. So what is financial aid? Financial aid is money to help students pay for college. That's basically what it is. And it's three main sources of financial aid. The grants and scholarships, which are the free financial aid and don't have to be repaid. Work study. So work study, the reason why that is a form of financial aid is it is a need-based award. Um, students have a campus job. The benefit to the student having that campus job is in subsequent years when they're applying for financial aid, work-study earnings are not considered income, so it doesn't get calculated towards that student's contribution. The benefit to the employer on campus is they're only paying a small percentage of the student's wages. Work-study earnings are paid through a paycheck Work study cannot be used as a credit against the bill. It has to be earned. Um, and it helps to pay for the indirect expenses. And we'll see when we get to the slide that talks about the cost of attendance, what indirect expenses are. And then the third kind of financial aid are student loans. And the reason student loans are financial aid is because they have special repayment terms and they are the only loan option that a, a college student can borrow a loan without having a co-signer. Student loans must be repaid, and you do not have to accept the work study or the student loan as part of the financial aid award. Next slide. So this slide basically is showing you what the financial aid breakdown is. This is for undergraduate students in the 2016-2017 award year and the big takeaway from this is there's $181.1 billion in financial aid available to students. Um, the tax credit info, so you see there is a little bubble here that talks about um, the federal tax credits, 9%. You can find those tax credit information in publication 970 from the IRS. <coughs> So first we're gonna talk about merit financial aid. <clears throat> so merit financial aid is awarded in recognition of some sort of student achievement. It could be academic, athletic, artistic, a music scholarship. It might have renewable scholarships or it may not be renewable. Um, it's not offered at every school. Sometimes there is a separate application for it. Uh, sometimes it has a separate deadline. Sometimes you might have to do an audition for it, write an essay. Um, and you really have to be on your own looking for some of these um, kind of merit scholarships. Check the school, see. Every school can have their own process for applying for merit scholarships. For example, at UMass Amherst, your admission application is your application for merit. The admission staff are considering you for a merit scholarship when they're reviewing your application. Um, this is where I like to talk about the, the merit scholarship that my son got. So my son got a scholarship, the name of it was a freshman merit scholarship. So you would think that the freshman merit scholarship would only be available for the freshman year, 
but it was a four-year scholarship, and that was the name of the scholarship. So you really have to inquire and ask questions about these merit scholarships. Think about what the renewal process is. Do you have to maintain a certain GPA in order to keep that merit scholarship? So each school can have merit scholarships, not necessarily. There is one non-need-based um, merit aid scholarship in the state of Massachusetts, and that, that is the John and Abigail Adams scholarship. So that is essentially a tuition waiver. So for example, at UMass Amherst, the value of the John and Abigail Adams scholarship is $1,714. And students need to maintain a 3.0 GPA in order to keep that. I think that's everything on that slide. Okay, next slide is talking about need-based financial aid. So most financial aid is awarded based on a family's ability to pay for college, not grades, not some sort of standardized test that they're taking. Um, most federal financial aid and most Massachusetts financial aid is based on financial eligibility. Um, Colleges can also offer institutional funds that are based on um, financial eligibility. For example, at UMass, it's known as the UMass Amherst Grant, and it is a need-based scholarship. Um, students need to be making satisfactory academic progress in order to keep their financial aid. And you will hear a lot about this once the student enrolls in school, and they need to maintain a certain level of credits and a certain GPA, for example, at UMass Amherst, after four semesters, the student must have a 2.0 GPA. So if they don't have that 2.0 GPA after four semesters, they have a semester of warning where they continue to be eligible for financial aid, but they're on warning. So if they subsequently, after that one semester of, of warning, still don't have that 2.0 GPA, they need to appeal to the financial aid office in order to keep their financial aid. Okay, sources of financial aid. So the next slide is talking about sources of financial aid. Financial aid can come from the federal government. For example, a Pell Grant is an example of a federal grant and that federal Pell Grant is based on financial need. So a student who has the maximum financial need for a Pell Grant would be eligible for $6,095. Um, it can come from the state of Massachusetts, Mass Grant State scholarships, tuition waivers. A note about tuition waivers. There are many different tuition waivers in the state of Massachusetts. You can be a dependent, you can have be an employee of the university and have a dependent tuition waiver. You can be a client of Mass Rehab and have a tuition waiver. You have that John and Abigail Adams scholarship, which is a tuition waiver. My point in mentioning all these different tuition waivers is that you're only eligible for the value of tuition. So you may be awarded multiple tuition waivers, but you can only have up to the value of tuition. You can't stack them. And then financial aid comes from colleges and universities. Um, UMass Amherst Grants is an example of um, some, and then some colleges will have their own loan program. So there's all different ways um, that you can get these scholarships. Um, and then there are outside agency scholarships. You should absolutely positively be doing your own scholarship search right now. Go on to the different colleges that you're interested in applying to. They will have scholarships. Amy, this is your chance to give your chat about scholarships here at Frontier Regional High School. I'm sure you have them here. Hi everyone, so for scholarships, we will be meeting with students in a couple weeks to go over how they can do their own searches for scholarships, but just so you are, are all are aware, we do have a scholarship update that is available on our um, guidance website, on the Frontier Regional website, that's updated monthly, and so on that, we have the scholarship listed, we have the amount of the award listed, and we have the criteria as well as the deadline. 
Um, if you're going to go look at that right now, you'll see that there's not that much on there, and that's because what's available this time of year is mostly national scholarships. So the pool for that is obviously quite large. Students are still welcome to apply for those, but that scholarship update becomes much longer, four to five pages, once we enter the spring semester. Um, and at that point, we'll be updating that even more more frequently than monthly, um, and we have students that are frequently coming into the office to see what the scholarship update says. So in addition to having that update online, we also have a hard copy in our office, and for some scholarships, we do provide additional material for them if they have their own hard copy. Um, so once we get into the March, April, portion of the year, we're hearing from the Conway scholarships, the Sunderland scholarships, so every local scholarship we will be hearing about, um, and students usually are making more frequent visits to the office at that point in the year to see what is changing. In addition to that, we are, we're also going to be having a Frontier Financial Aid form that will be released to students um, in late January, early February, and by filling out that form, students are eligible for a handful of different scholarships um, just by filling out that one form. Um, we usually only have about 75% of our students fill it out, and we really would like to see that be 100 because there's no reason not to fill out that form. So we will be sending that home as well. We want to encourage all of you to encourage your student to do that at that time. I know students are quite tired from the admissions process um, come April and March, but we really want to keep their spirits up so they're still getting the aid that they need to have during that time. Thanks, Amy. Um, Another couple, another couple of things, MIFA.org has a whole page devoted to scholarships and different scholarship search engines. So you can go on to MIFA.org. And then never pay for a scholarship. If you're paying for a scholarship, it's a scam. So just keep that in mind. Next slide. So now we're gonna talk a little bit more about those student loans, the Federal Direct Student Loan Program. We talked about the fact that the students don't need a co-borrower. The student is the sole, sole borrower on that loan. <clears throat> There's no credit check. They can, there can be a subsidized student loan or an unsubsidized student loan. And the difference between the two, a subsidized loan has a six-month grace period after graduation before the interest starts to accrue or any repayment is required. An unsubsidized loan is not based on need, so this is where there's something for everyone. So an unsubsidized loan can be not based on need. So the interest starts to accrue as soon as the loan is dispersed to the student, and the student can either pay the interest while they're enrolled in school, or they can postpone that payment of the interest until after graduation, but the loan will grow by the amount of the interest that's not being paid. It's called capitalization, okay. So there are annual limits to these loans. For example, in the freshman year, a student is eligible for $3,500 of an unsubsidized loan. So in the sophomore year, students are eligible for $4,500 of a subsidized loan. And then in the junior and senior year, they're eligible for $5,500 of a subsidized loan. Each grade level, in addition to that subsidized loan, is eligible for $2,000 of an unsubsidized loan. Um, so a family who has no need, and there is a slide farther down that explains what need is, would be eligible for $5,500 of an unsubsidized student loan. So students who borrow the maximum student loan for all four years will end up borrowing approximately $27,000 of debt over four years. And that will amount to about a $300 monthly payment. I get new batteries. That's awesome. I didn't want to have to do this all without. Ooh. Lost my place. Okay. Okay. Correct. I was going to go back over and redo that. Subsidized. So each grade level has a maximum subsidized loan for that grade level. So freshmen, it's 3,500. Sophomores, it's 4,500. And juniors and seniors, it's 5,500. And along with the subsidized loan is a $2,000 unsubsidized loan. So freshman total borrowing is 5,500. 
sophomores 6,500, and juniors and seniors 7,500. Students will sign a master promissory note. That master promissory note is good for 10 years. Um, but they have made some chatter. There's been some talk about changing that so students would have to redo that master promissory note every year. So if you would like more information about student loans, studentloans.gov has all sorts of really helpful information about borrowing loans. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the application process, the financial aid application process. Okay. So this is where you want to have your timeline. I can't stress to you enough how important it is for you to know the deadlines for all the different schools that you're applying to. So every school can have their own deadline. So right now what you want to be doing is as you are looking at colleges for admission, you want to be taking a little mosey over to the financial aid site for that college and find out what their application process is and what their deadline is, okay? Each college can have a different deadline. Um, missing a deadline can, can mean missing out on thousands of dollars in financial aid. And some schools run out of financial aid, even if you are on time. So you want to get your application in as soon as you possibly can. Okay, so first we're going to talk about the FAFSA form, the free application for federal financial aid, for federal student aid. Um, hold on, I lost my place. So the FAFSA used to come out on March 1. So last year, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, they changed the process. So the FAFSA form becomes available on October 1st. So you will need an FSA ID in order to electronically sign your application. And that is something that you can be doing right now. So get your FSA ID um, on FAFSA. It becomes available on October 1st on FAFSA.gov. And for this new, for the, the next financial aid award cycle, there is going to be a mobile application. So students can fill out their FAFSA form on their tablet or on their phone. Um, so that is something new for the next academic year. So that's going to be interesting. And you can, so what will happen is the student will log on with their FSA ID and complete their part of the financial aid application. And then the parents will log on with their FSA ID and fill out their part of the mobile FAFSA form. Okay, so fsaid.ed.gov is where you get your FSA ID. Okay, so when you're filling out your financial aid application, you can also use the IRS data retrieval tool. So what this is, is you upload your tax information with your financial aid application. So all of your tax information is available to get populated onto your FAFSA form. So there will be a FAFSA day in October. So the local FAFSA day that helps students and families fill out their financial aid application is at Amherst Regional High School on October 25th. Okay. So once that October 1st FAFSA opens up, then the IRS data retrieval tool, so if you try to use it right now, you won't be able to, you won't be able to get into it. Okay. Let's see if there's any more information. You must complete the FAFSA form every year. It's not a one and done, but in your first year, you're filling it out from beginning to end, and then in subsequent years, some of the information will be pre-populated. You have a question. So the question is, if you've already done a FAFSA form for one child, do you need to do a FAFSA form for your second child? Yes. yes. The information is unique to each student. 
However, you don't need a new FSA ID. You already have one. Okay. Okay, so much information on each slide. I want to make sure that I get it all for you. Yes. So what's reported on the FAFSA form? You need to be a US citizen or an eligible non-citizen in order to apply for financial aid. It lists all the colleges that the students are applying to. You're filling out parent information. So if parents are married, if parents live together and are not married, you include both parents. If parents are divorced, you only include the custodial parents information on the FAFSA form. So who is the custodial parent? It's who the student lived with the most in the previous year. If the student lived with both parents an equal amount of time, it's who provided the most support. If parents provided equal amounts of support, make a decision. Who is the custodial parent? One parent is the custodial parent. You're including both the parent and the student asset information. This includes your savings, checking, investment, other property, so what I always like to tell families is you're filling out your asset information as of the day that you are completing the FAFSA form and you cannot update it. So what I always tell families is pay your monthly bills, then fill out that question. Okay. Do not include your primary home. Do not include the value of your retirement, life insurance, small family businesses, Include the number in the household size and include the number in college. Make sure you include that college senior as someone who is in college and you must exclude any parents that are in college. Same sex parents who live together and parents who have never been married who live together complete the FAFSA form together. Some untaxed income is not included on the FAFSA form. Foster care benefits, earned income credit, additional child tax credits, welfare payments, untaxed social security benefits. So you can also go to MIFA.org and you can see a paper copy of all of the financial aid FAFSA questions online. If you would like to look at all the different questions before you go online, you, you want to make sure that you complete the online application at FAFSA.gov. There is a paper application available, but you don't want to use that paper application because you could get yourself all the way through the paper application process and make an error that would not allow you to continue if you were using the online application. So make sure that you're using um, the online application. So 529 accounts are a parent asset. Okay, but if a grandparent is the owner of that asset and is contributing that 529 account to your student, that would be considered untaxed income on the FAFSA form. Okay, other financial aid applications. So in the beginning, we talked about the fact that you want to look and see what each school's application process is. So schools can have, all schools must ask you to complete the FAFSA form, but they can also ask you to complete the profile form, and they can also have an institutional application. It's unusual that there's also an institutional application, but some schools still do have an institutional application. So the profile form is typically completed by the more selective colleges that have larger endowments that are using their own needs analysis formula to award that institutional financial aid. Now, some of those selective colleges will ask you when you're filling out the admission application, do you plan to apply for financial aid? My daughter answered no when she was, when she was filling out her admission application to one of the colleges. And then I just went in and filled out the financial aid application, and I got a call from the college saying, wait a minute, you said you weren't filling out your financial aid application. 
So I said, no, she must have made a mistake. So some schools, your application for admission will take a different route if you're applying for financial aid or you're not applying for financial aid. Some schools are need blind. For example, UMass Amherst is need blind. No one in the admissions office knows anything about the financial aid application process for a student. But some other schools may be need sensitive. So if you have two students who are academically the same, but one student might be needy for financial aid and the other one might not be needy for financial aid, they may choose the student who is less needy. Um, some schools, if you don't apply for financial aid in the freshman year, you're not eligible to apply for financial aid again until the junior year. So you want to make sure that if you are applying to some of the more selective schools or you're looking at the admission, the financial aid application process, make sure you understand what the process is for each school. The profile fee is $25 for the first school and then $16 for each additional school. So make sure that you need to complete that profile form before you complete it for each school. Um, there is no longer a separate application for non-custodial parents on the, on the profile form. So the custodial parent will fill it out and then the non-custodial parent will fill it out. And I mentioned previously that if you do have to complete the profile form, BFI has a great webinar that walks you through the process. Sometimes it is good. Yes, I'm sure you can go on their website, the collegeboard.org. You couldn't find it? Let me follow up and I'll get the answer for, for Amy, okay? Because I'll, I'll get that answer for you. So the next slide, after you apply. So you're filling out the FAFSA form with um, a school code. Each school has their own code. We get the information electronically. So you, the student, will also get a student aid report, a SAR. And on that student aid report, we'll have all the information that you put down on the financial aid application. So this is your chance to review the information that you put down on that student aid report and make sure that it's accurate. Or if you completed it on October 1st, and you're using perhaps not, maybe there's gonna be two in college and you only said there's gonna be one in college. So this is your chance when you get your student aid report to make corrections to your information to make sure that it's correct because the information that's on your FAFSA form is going to translate into what your financial aid award is. And your financial aid award is going to translate into helping you make a decision about which college you're going to go to. So you wanna make sure that the information on the FAFSA form is as accurate as possible so the schools can give you as accurate a financial aid award as possible. Um, some schools will select students for verification. So verification is essentially an audit of the information that you put down on your financial aid application with other documents. So if you've used the IRS data retrieval tool when you applied for financial aid, then essentially you've satisfied the tax document request for verification. If you don't use the data retrieval tool, then you'll be required to submit a tax return transcript, uh, which is not the same as a tax return. A tax return transcript comes directly from the IRS to the school. Um, the financial aid application process is not complete until you submit these documents. So this is a good example of why you want to have an email account that you have access to as well as the student because the schools will be contacting you electronically to submit these documents for verification. Okay. And your financial aid award will not be final until that verification process is complete. So um, if you don't submit your application, your verification documents until sometime over the summer, and you've made a mistake on your FAFSA form and the school is required to update the information, the financial aid award could potentially change 
through verification. Um, so you're filling out your financial aid application in October. So if your circumstances change since you complete that financial aid application process, each school will have an appeal process so that if your circumstances have changed, they can go in and take a second look at your eligibility for financial aid. How financial aid decisions are made is the next slide. Okay, we're gonna move forward one more. So each school will determine a cost of attendance, okay? So if you go onto a school's financial aid website, perhaps it'll be different than the admissions cost of attendance because the admissions cost of attendance may just include tuition and fees and room and board. So what the financial aid office is doing is putting together a living budget. What is it truly gonna cost that student to be a student for nine months? So they're going to include books. At UMass Amherst, we put in $500 for books. They're going to include personal expenses. At UMass Amherst, we put $1,000 in for personal expenses. And they're going to include travel because there will be times that a student will have to leave that campus when the university is closed, for example. So they will put in a travel allowance for that student. Uh, at UMass Amherst, it's $400. So what we're doing in the financial aid office is putting together a living budget. What is it truly going to cost that student? For example, that $1,000, if the student is from California, they may need a winter coat. They're gonna eat meals away from campus. They're gonna go to the movies. So we build into the cost of attendance what it really costs for nine months for a student to be there. So we've got the tuition and fees, the room and board, the books and supplies, the transportation and the personal expenses. So remember we talked about work study, how it helps to fund the indirect expenses. That's what that work study job is doing. It might help them pay for their books. It might help them with their transportation. It might help them with their personal expenses. Um, but the financial aid office is going to calculate that into the cost of attendance. And so the next thing we're going to talk about is the expected family contribution. The expected family contribution reflects the family's ability to absorb educational expenses. It's not what the student or the family pays to the university. And every family is, you, we're using the same federal formula to calculate that expected family contribution. Now some schools, if they have, are using the profile form are going to use an institutional formula to calculate how much the student will be eligible for in, say, an endowment scholarship. But the whole purpose of putting together what that expected family contribution is, is because the family has the primary responsibility for paying for college. So that's what we start with, is the expected family contribution. And it gets lowered, so if there's two in college, it'll be less. If there's three in college, it'll be even less, okay? So there are some great four, um, calculators out there. So the EFC calculator is bigfuture.collegeboard.org or FAFSA Forecaster. So you can go out there onto these um, calculators and put your information in and come up with what your expected family contribution will be. Each school is required to have a net price calculator. So the information for these net price calculators is only as accurate as the information that you put in. Different schools ask different questions on their calculators. And the net price calculators do not include the full cost of college. So commuters um, will see housing costs with the net price calculator output. Uh, MIFA has some really helpful tools on their website, again, to help you with these net price calculators. And that's at mifa.org slash using net price calculators. So it's really helpful information. 
and it provides a personal estimated net price of what college is going to cost. Some schools ask a lot of questions on their net price calculators. So here is the formula that we use to determine eligibility for financial aid. We're looking at that cost of attendance, the COA, minus the expected family contribution, equals the student's financial aid eligibility. So if you have a family who has, say the th cost of attendance is $30,000, and the expected family contribution is 32,000, they don't have any financial need, that family would be eligible, or that student would be eligible for a $5,500 unsubsidized student loan. The EFC, expected family contribution, stays the same regardless of the institution, but the cost of attendance will change. So now we're going to look at a slide that gives you um, an example of how the assets are impacted with the, on the expected family contribution. So we have a family of four with one in college. So family A, B and C all have combined incomes of $75,000. Um, family A doesn't have any savings, and their EFC is $7,415. Family B saves $75,000, and their EFC is $2,758 different than family A's. And family C has $150,000 of assets and their EFC is $6,988 different. So while assets do have an impact and are considered in the financial aid formula, assets do have a minimal impact on the expected family contribution. It's mostly income driven, as we'll see in the next slide. So now we're looking at how income has an impact on the expected family contribution. So family A made 75,000, they all have $50,000 in assets, but family A, B, and C make 75, 100, and $150,000. And you can see from family A to family C, from 75 to $150,000, there's a $24,431 difference in that expected family contribution. So the point of these two slides is to demonstrate that assets do count, but the formula is very much income driven. So now we're going to see how the formula works. So we have four different colleges. College, college D costs $4,000. So that student has very little financial need. And then you see college A that cost $70,000. The EFC stays the same throughout these four different colleges, but the eligibility for financial aid increases. So while it's important to have a financial or an admission safety school, you want to have a financial aid safety school, and you also want to have one that maybe is a little out of reach, but you're not, you, you may be eligible for a great financial aid package if you have exactly what that school is looking for in terms of a student. So now we're going to, this slide demonstrates how the formula works and what happens with money being put into the barrel. So the unmet need and the EFC are the family's responsibility, okay? So we have an expected family contribution here of $5,000. That's the first thing that goes in the barrel. Then the student got perhaps a merit scholarship for $9,500. That's the next thing that goes into the barrel. They're eligible for $15,500 in grant money. They've got the maximum student loans for $5,500. They've got a $2,000 work study award. So they have unmet need of $7,500. So the $5,000 and the $7,500 essentially are the family's responsibility for paying for college, along with the fact that that work-study award has to be earned. It can't be deducted from the bill that the student receives.
So now we're going to look at some award letters. So once again, we have a cost of attendance of $45,000. We have an expected family contribution of $5,000, so the total eligibility for financial aid is $40,000. So College A, College B, and College C all got to that. College A has no unmet need but they have given $32,500 $32, in grant money. All the schools are giving the maximum student loans. All of the schools are giving the maximum work-study award. So it's a matter of how the colleges are getting to um, fill that need. The first college is filling the need, and the second college, or the third college, has $15,000 of unmet need. Now, there is a great um, MIFA presentation. It's called After the Award, or I think it happens, do you, are you familiar with it? Yes. After the college acceptance. And so MIFA counselors will go regionally to different high schools and help students and their families decipher the financial aid awards. So the next slide, once again, we've got the $45,000 cost of attendance, $5,000 in the EFC, $40,000 of eligibility. Um, the difference on this slide is they've inserted a parent loan. So the parent loan on College B and College C is a credit-based loan that parents can apply for. They're not necessarily going to be um, eligible for that parent-based credit loan. But they're putting that in as part of the financial aid award. So you can see all three different colleges have the same unmet need. It's just a matter of how they got there. And College C didn't give any grant money whatsoever. So perhaps that student was a late applicant at that school. And that's why they didn't get any grant money. So the next section that we're going to talk about is paying for college. So this is where we like to talk about the past, the present, and the future. So use all three when coming up with how to pay for college. So past will be any student savings, summer earnings, parent savings. Um, do you have a 529 account? How would you like to use that um, savings that you've got? Your present income. Um, how much are you willing to pay when that bill comes? The colleges, many colleges will offer a payment plan. For example, at UMass Amherst, we have a 10-month payment plan. Five payments go to the fall semester, five payments go to the spring semester. So for an enrollment fee, you can spread out the cost of what you owe over 10 months. And then after you've thought about the past, the present, if you still owe a balance, then you might want to think about a private education loan. MIFA has a great one. There are many different credit-based loans. So if you went onto the financial aid website at UMass Amherst, you would see all of the alternative financing options that made it to be on our website. They have to meet certain criteria in order to be on our website, but they met that criteria. And there's all the different kinds of credit-based loans that families can apply for. So let's talk about additional considerations that you need to think about. Um, this is where I like to say to families, think about where it is that your son or daughter is applying to. And if they're thinking about going to a college that's far away, then think about the additional expense that you will have, because you will have to get, there, get them there in September. They're going to want to come home for Thanksgiving. They're going to have to come home at the end of the fall semester. You're going to have to get them back for spring semester. They're going to have to leave for spring break for a week. Then you're going to have to get them back in May at the end of the semester. And then think about one emergency visit. So figure out what one trip will cost you, and then times it by at least six, and add that on to your cost of attendance, because that's an additional expense that you will have. Um, think about what their major is, and are there 
expenses associated with their major that you may not know about. This is when I like to say uh, there was one semester that my daughter was doing a clinical rotation and she had to cross the Verrazano Bridge every day <clears throat> for, for a whole month. So we got our um, fast lane pass and it had an additional $350 on it and we couldn't figure out what it was from. And then we remembered that she was crossing over the Verrazano Bridge every day to go to this clinical rotation. Are there medical supplies? Are there artistic things that they will need? So these are all the additional financial considerations that you need to think about. Think about it in terms of total enrollment. Is it a four-year program? Perhaps it's a five-year program. Are there other siblings that you need to be thinking about? Is the student considering graduate school? Know your credit score before you apply for credit-based loans. If you are denied one of these um, credit-based loans, the parent loan for undergraduate student, then the student becomes eligible for additional unsubsidized direct student loans. So you want to compare each school's net price after the financial aid offers are received. Um, so go to one of those great sessions that MIFA offers after the acceptance. So paying for college in Massachusetts, you have options. The mass transfer, so if you went to uh, a community college for two years, um, and then you move on and go to one of the state universities, they, they have an um, automatic transfer program. The Commonwealth commitment, the tuition break if you live out of state, um, obviously it doesn't apply to people in this room because most of us are all in state residence. So uh, the Commonwealth commitment, you begin at one of the Massachusetts community colleges, you complete your associate's degree within two and a half years, you transfer to one of Massachusetts state universities or UMass campuses, and then you complete your bachelor's degree within two more years, and you maintain full-time continuous enrollment and a GPA of 3.0, and you're eligible for a scholarship. You get a freeze on tuition and mandatory fees for all four years upon entering the Commonwealth Commitment Program until the student leaves or graduates, and you get a reduction in tuition and mandatory fees. So that's something to think about. So the financial aid office. So you want to look at the college that you're admitted to and use the resources that that college has to help you. Ask for special considerations. Can I appeal my financial aid award? So if you've lost your job or you're underemployed, um, perhaps there's an appeal process. If there are medical expenses, um, that are exorbitant or you have high medical expenses. Um, ask about what the renewal criteria is. Remember one of those colleges I talked about, you can apply for admission or financial aid in the freshman year, but not again, if you don't apply, then you're not eligible to apply until the junior year. Use every avenue of the financial aid office. Go in person, go to their new students orientation. Um, make sure that you check out their websites. Make sure you know what their scholarship opportunities are. So um, the FAFSA Day. So fafsaday.org is where you register to attend one of those FAFSA Day sessions. Um, like I said, the one at Amherst Regional High School is on October 25th, myself and one of the associate directors from Amherst College were the co-site coordinators for that. So if you would like some help filling out your FAFSA form, it's going to be in the library on October 25th in the evening. I think it's at 7 o'clock. Um, scholarships, fastweb.org, goodcall.com, and mifapathway.org are all good places to go for resources. So the after the college's acceptance seminars, they provide assistance and clarity on your financial aid award, the college bill, different payment plans, college loans, what to ask the financial aid office. Um, one of the things we did not talk about is outside scholarships. So if a student gets a scholarship, for example, if you get a scholarship from Frontier Regional High School at graduation, 
Um, one of the questions you want to make sure that you ask the colleges is how do you treat an outside scholarship? So every college can do something different with those outside scholarships. For example, um, perhaps it fills unmet need. That's what we do at UMass Amherst. An outside scholarship will first fill unmet need. But some colleges will replace a scholarship that you've received with any institutional grant money that they've given the student. So you want to find out what they, how they treat outside scholarships. So what you can do right now, you want to make sure that you sign up for the MIFA, MIFA emails. You want to make sure that you get yourself an FSA ID and for both the parent and the student. You want to make sure that you research those deadlines and required applications. You want to sign up for any upcoming webinars on mefa.org slash events. And you want to start completing your application. So you can't complete the application until October 1st. But you can certainly go online and look at that paper application and see what the questions are and gather up all the information that you need to get together. Oh, and I didn't fill this in. My name is Sheila. <laughs> I sent this a week ago to Amy. <laughs> I forgot to send, put in that section, that part of it. So, do folks have questions? I know it's a lot of information. You're probably going, wow, she gave me so much information in that hour. Was it an hour? Yeah, it was exactly an hour. <laughs> so, uh, questions? You inherited some property. Okay. So you would include the value of the property on your FAFSA form. Is that value or market value? Market value. More questions? Okay, so the question is, in 2017, you had great income, and now, currently, your income has declined. How do I approach that on my FAFSA form? So you want to complete your FAFSA form with the 2017 information, and then you want to contact the colleges or go on their website. So if you went onto the financial aid website for UMass Amherst, you would find a special circumstance appeal form, um, and we would ask you to Tell us what your current income is in 2018. And we may use your 2018 income for one time to do a special circumstance appeal for you. So you would write a letter, explain your circumstances, submit supporting documentation, and complete the appeal form. And most colleges will have an appeal process. More questions? OK. Thank you all for coming tonight. If you've got any questions along the way, you can contact any financial aid person in any financial aid office, and we're more than happy to answer your questions. And if you've